Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Can everybody hear me okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Good. So what? You have a fancy new classroom, high-tech classroom, lots of new toys. Is it being used? How is it being used? Good afternoon and welcome to End Users Used to Technology. I am Greg Clinton, your moderator for this session. Some time ago, we had some middle schoolers come to the law school to get a tour of the law school in the newly renovated classroom that we had. And uh, after I demonstrated the technologies available in the classroom, a middle schooler came up to me and said, let me get this right. Uh, it's your job to work with all this technology. And I said, yeah. He said, wow, what a cool job. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we do have a cool job. Our, de our technology dependency at, at NCCU Law School has grown over the last five years. Um, we, um, we have created a technology-friendly environment at law school. The panelists you'll hear from today will have consistently used technology in their classes and continue to improve upon how they use it. Because we have so many faculty members using technology at law school, it's difficult to select uh, which professors to ask to participate in this panel discussion. I try to select professors who actually have classes in the newest renovated classrooms and are doing different things. I'm delighted to have here a cross section of that faculty who have taken ownership of the technology available and integrated into their work. Over the next few minutes uh, after a short PowerPoint presentation uh, that includes our approach to technology, an overview of, of the renovations in the classroom and what tech um, <clears throat> in the classroom and what technology is being used by the panelists. Each panelist will take about 10 minutes to tell you what course or courses they're take, they teach, what was the impetus behind their use of technology, and discuss how they use it and what results were achieved. Then we'll conclude with a question and answer session.
Deborah Jeffries, and the course that I teach is called Legal Bibliography. My goal in teaching this course is to introduce the law student to the various formats of primary and secondary sources. Now, like most professors, I'm always looking for innovative ways to achieve my goal, improve learning outcomes, and make the class more interesting and enjoyable. I have found the instructional technology available in the smart classroom to be an asset to the teaching methodologies typically used in the presentation of a course like legal bibliography. Incorporating technology requires a substantial amount of preparation and planning. With the instructional support and encouragement of the technology staff, I am able to use a combination of instructional technologies available in the smart classroom to identify, describe, demonstrate, and evaluate print and electronic legal resources, hopefully improve learning outcome, and make the class entertaining. Now, with technology, I literally bring the library into the classroom. It allows me to use visual images to describe and compare uh, print and electronic sources and illustrate each step of the research process without having to push a cart of books into the classroom, set up an overhead uh, or LCD projector and screen, or to roll in a VCR and monitor cart. I use an electronic presentation like PowerPoint during my lecture to set out how the course is organized. I follow the instructional theme throughout the course, setting out the important points of the lecture in bulleted format. Visual images of the sources, tables and diagrams of how the sources are organized, and flowcharts describing the methodology used in finding legal authority or incorporated to present and reinforce the information. I include clip art that demonstrates bulleted points to make the slideshow more interesting and entertaining. Because face it, Unless there's another librarian in the class, the only person interested in legal bibliography or excited about it in the class is me. <laughs> Thanks to the digital camera, I can take a visual image of a source, incorporate it into my PowerPoint presentation, and show it to everyone in the class simultaneously. The digital camera takes a good picture of images, but it does not take a good picture of textual materials. To get a good readable image of a page of text that I want to incorporate into my PowerPoint presentation, I use a scanner. I demonstrate how to solve a research problem by utilizing scanned images of tables of contents, indices, and pages of text from primary and secondary sources. Now, I use a scanner instead of the document camera that is available in the smart classroom because legal sources are usually and an image of the entire page is necessary to explain the research process. The document camera provides only a landscape view, making it impossible to see the entire page of the text. The technology-ready classroom makes it possible to incorporate the internet into my PowerPoint pre presentation. I toggle between websites and my PowerPoint presentation to compare and evaluate web-based and print resources demonstrate the multiple formats that can be used to find primary and secondary sources, access the question and answer section of an applicable Cali lesson, and review my syllabus on twin. When planning to toggle between websites and my PowerPoint presentation, I open the windows I want to incorporate before the class starts. I use the Alt and Tab keys on the computer to effectuate a smooth transition between each electronic application. So does the benefit of utilizing technology justify its cost? In other words, is it worth the expense of technology and the time and planning required to use it effectively? In a course like Legal Bibliography, where you are describing and demonstrating the use of multiple sources in a variety of formats to a class of more than 100 students, instructional technology is a godsend. As far as learning outcomes, I cannot say definitively that student test grades have improved significantly since I incorporated instructional technology, but I do know this. After 17 years of teaching this class, 
Last semester was the first time I ever received an applause at the end of the course. <laughs> now, I don't know if the applause was because the students found the class to be just that entertaining, but the learning outcome was accomplished. Either way, I'm going to take the applause as a compliment because if nothing else, I can say that with instructional technology, at least I got their attention. My name is Jim Beckwith. I want to send out a special greeting to any Cali bloggers who are in here. I uh, had a good time getting to know you folks better this morning, perhaps learning more about you than I, I wanted to know. <laughs> but uh, Eric, Chuck, Stephanie, Jim, Ronald, and Francis, any of you here? Maybe not. You don't have to. Oh, hi there. Welcome. And uh, one of you was curious about a strange looking tree that you saw coming into Durham. So if anybody has any questions about local floral, call on send me after, afterwards. Uh, I teach contracts and commercial law. And what I want to do is, first of all, talk about assumptions. Because I think it's always important to define your terms and state what your assumptions are. And then if someone disagrees with your assumptions, you can discuss the assumptions, rather than just taking them for granted and moving from there. So the question is, well, what do I aim to accomplish? Well, I teach the quintessential first year course in contracts, and I also teach commercial law to third year students. So I have the wonderful contrast of people who will believe anything you tell them, and then people who will believe nothing you tell them. And uh, so let's contrast the goals of contracts for one else and in my case, uh, I teach in our evening program, and we have a four-year program, so I have ones and twos in the same class. So I have the ones are playing catch-up. So I, I, I emphasize them at the beginning of the semester because they, uh, the two L's, know how to play the game. So let's contrast what you would try to accomplish with what I assume, in my sense, of uh, teaching contracts and commercial law. Contracts for the first year has, to my mind, certain goals. Teaching case reading, teaching statutory analysis, learning a new language, um, and a bit of jurisprudence. Uh, I will confess I'm what you might call a, a modest realist. I think that in common law adjudication, policy concerns are important. I am not a, uh, a postmodernist nihilist. I don't find that useful. But um, in any event, uh, my teaching is, I think some would say, doctrinally oriented, although I consider myself a realist and will focus on looking for the two causes in any opinion of doctrine and policy. Uh, in commercial law, uh, there uh, you have a challenge of one, getting the interest of a 3L who is tired of the game and wants to get out of it. And also uh, statutory material. So I emphasize the text of the code with problems and problem solving. Some case reading, but not much. I have found in teaching commercial law that the, the reading endless cases is pretty excruciating and uh, not uh, all that uh, helpful. I consciously focus on the text of the code and problems. I do not take a pure problem approach or focus exclusively on transactional reality. If your goal is transactional reality and you make an antecedent assumption that the, code, the students are expected to know the code when they come in, then you're playing a different game. My assumption about the use of technology assumes that the text of the statute will be a focal point and that there will be some focus on transactional uh, reality, but not, that will not be the primary focus. So let's think in terms of technology in the context of these two courses. How do you use the technology? My first challenge, and this may sound prosaic, but this is what we have to deal with. When I came into the smart classroom for the first time, it was the question of the microphones. Any of you who have a, a, a smart room with, this, with the mic, with the, the lectern and student mics, have to grapple with the question of they'll always slam the book down on the top of the microphone and the people around them, their ear, and then you hear the bumps and the bangs 
and then the shriek. Sometimes there'll be some kind of interference and there'll be this high-pitched squeal, and nothing will derail a discussion faster than people who are going like this. And <laughs> you're trying to keep the discussion going. So after trial and error, I have, for better or for worse, when I teach, my microphone is on, theirs is off. Until we get some, my, my kids still bring the books into the classroom. So as long as you've got books on the, the desk, the student mics are problematic. So there's a cost benefit to be, con to be considered. Now, the, the, the joy of my teaching is the smart board and the screen and the web. Um, our smart board is a wonderful device. You have a, a screen that will come down, and then you have the board over here. And you can either go to the smart board, and um, let's say you're doing uh, third-party beneficiaries and contracts. Well, the neat thing you can do with your smart board is you, you have your board over here, and, and you're getting a student to do Siever versus Ransom or some of the old first-time recognizing 3PBs. And you, you get them into the triangle, promise or promisee beneficiary. And you play the game of intent to benefit the beneficiary, the union and stuff. And again, over and over again, you can use the triangle. And the triangle, our screen is it the same size as this same size. same size. Here you've got, I love it. I love this cliche. Whatever you put there is in the, it, it's in your face. Mm -hmm. There's nobody who can say, I didn't bring the code today, or what, what, what's that? What you, and, and the thing about it's so much better than a blackboard for so many reasons. But you smart board, you put up your diagram, and then if you want to clean it up, you just pip, it disappears. You don't have to erase. You don't have smeared chalk. You don't have any of that excruciating mess to deal with. So I hope you'll have the joy of a smart board and a uh, screen. And it works with cases. Anytime you want to diagram something, you can, and they see it, you're working over here, and um, it is a, a great help. Um, now, as I said, the smart board, in my view, is much better than a blackboard because you can clean it up or you can, you can keep your panels. You can just do something and then save it, and then you go to the next point, and then you can go back to where you were and say, do you remember what we said about this? There's the diagram, and it flips back up. Um, now, of course, um, then the question is, you've got your, your smart boards, you've got your screen, and the question, to my mind, is should you go to the web in class? Um, some things are cute but not really helpful. I have a colleague who's teaching entertainment law, and she plays music for the recessional after class is over. Uh, did that once or twice. That's kind of cute, but um, let me give you an example. In contracts, does it help the discussion to throw up a photograph of Lady Duff Gordon in these elaborate gowns, or the front door of the Walker Thomas store in Washington that was the basis for unconscionability 2302 and all that? Um, I'm not against it, but you don't want the bells and whistles of entertainment to become the tail that wags the dog. You don't want the mechanics of what you're doing to distract the students from the pedagogical goal of analysis and working with the materials. Um, of course, I've read much lately Cali and everywhere else that our students are entertainment oriented, video game oriented. They come with a different sensibility. As I get older, I become more archaic, I guess, uh, of short attention spans. And uh, But I, again, I think it's important that there are these bells and whistles, but you don't want them to distract the process of the classroom dynamic from the basic pedagogy of a hard analysis that is especially in my subject that you do. Now, uh, both in contracts and in uh, commercial, I have really become a fan of, of going to the Cornell website and throwing code sections up on the screen. It's really great, and part of it is hyperlinked. So if you're doing 
a section, for example, that requires good faith, and then you say, well, what does good faith mean? And they say, and sinners, and you finally get a number, and you click, and you jump to 1201, the old Article 1 good faith section, or Article 2, the merchants section, to show them how a statute is a chain letter, all these interactions. Um, the having, and my students love it when they have the code section in front of them. Because, for example, let's suppose you're teaching the Battle of the Forms, everybody's favorite exercise in contracts. And you've got beloved 2207, the most mysterious section, I suppose, in the code. And, although it's presumably about to change, um, Suppose you're teaching all 2207 and you ask whether the word acceptance in line three means the same thing as acceptance in line five. It doesn't. But that's one of the mysteries of the section. And you've got the text up there and then you say, okay, Mr. Jones, does acceptance in line three, you circle it, there it is, and then does it mean the same thing as acceptance made conditional, etc. in line five, you circle acceptance in line five. There's no way they can evade the question. Can you repeat that? <laughs> no. There it is. The technology has allowed me, again, it's in your face, that working with the text of the statute and your smart board and your screen, and you've got this wonderful uh, hyperlink version at Cornell. Uh, I haven't had time to explore whether there are other alternatives. But um, I've just found it. Terrific. And the students really, or the good students, love it. They come up to me afterwards. If, for example, one time, the, the uh, sorry, but if the heat gets too high in your classroom, the projector might get fried. And we had the, a day when we were down, and the students were very unhappy because they were sitting there with their codes, and it was, there wasn't, some of them were learned by visual cues because you've got to deal with differing learning stuff. And some people are verbal, and some people like the tactile sense of the book. Some people just take like duck to water to having the statute up there in front of them. But um, um, I think it's a wonderful supplement because you've got, and you can circle things, and you, you can do some things in red and some things in green, and you can say, well, does this word, how do they compare? And then you can work your problems. I haven't investigated how to bring technology to help me with, with problems in the classroom, but that will be my next uh, my next investigation. Um, of course, there are some recurring mysteries in, in a, in a high-tech environment, especially our evening students come from the workplace and they bring their laptops. We don't have a mandatory laptop policy. But in my evening contracts, there's a sea of laptops, and to a lesser extent in my day commercial course, and of course, they could be playing solitaire. I don't police laptop usage. I take the view that if you're an adult and you choose not to participate, that's your problem. Um, and monitoring laptop usage is, I, I just, I don't know. Um, in any event, um, now of course, using the code, uh, there's some interesting things you can do. Uh, you've got the code, say you throw up, uh, uh, 22091, and you're doing the, the pre-existing duty rule in contracts, and you start with the, the common law, and you work through, and you, you show the dangers of mechanical jurisprudence about how the rule never distinguished between good faith and bad faith modifications, and then you get to problem cases like Lenz versus Shuck, and the, where you want a good faith modification to be upheld, but you still got this archaic consideration rule. You throw up 22091, which gets rid of the consideration requirement in sales cases, but the heart of it, the key to analysis, is buried in a comment. Well, one of the nice things about the Cornell website is you, it shows you what, what Deborah would be pointing out, the difference between primary and secondary authority. The, code is, the, the comments are not enacted law. So that when the code is passed by a legislature, Article 2, the comments are then just added on as an afterthought, but the, the bill itself, the, the, the session law, does not contain the comments. But it's interesting how to, you could you throw it up there and then you say, well, okay, you've done away with the consideration requirement. How are you going to distinguish about 
do you want to enforce all modifications? And the students, and then one student will say, look, well, look in comment two. Well, comment two talks about the necessity of good faith, which is at the heart of this, it's sort of the end destination of the whole pre-existing duty rule, three classes probably that you take up with it. And uh, so again, it's, it's a nice way to point out, uh, be careful about assuming uh, that the law is always going to be found in, in the text because uh, that's one example where the comments are very important. Uh, email and twin for what I designated to Greg as an online tutorial. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, my examinations take three formats, short answer section, multiple, multi multiple choice in the multi-state format, and then essays. And I always place the previous two years' worth of exams on reserve, on twin. I then tell them that I will recycle approximately 20 to 25 percent of the final from those two previous finals. But they will not know what questions I'm going to pick. So they have to work them all in order to have those questions prepped and ready to go when they take my exam. So I create an incentive. I went to law school in Chicago, so I'm big on incentives. <laughs> and uh, so I want to create an incentive to make these kids work hard. It works for the one else because they're scared. And it works for the three else because as reluctant as they may be, they see it's in their self-interest to do so. So one of my proud accomplishments is how much my three else complain to me about how hard they're working in my commercial law course because they're having to work all these problems because with two years worth of exams, they'll have about 100 multiples and 60 short answers to work with. And I won't post the right answers. The only way they get a comment from me is to email me and analyze the problem and tell me how they got to their right answer. And if, they are, if they're correct, I'll say yes. If they're not, I'll say, well, look what you said in line three. Now, I wrote the question, so I know what I was looking for. And um, it's a lot of work. I don't know that, that, that many would want to be willing to get that volume of email that I get. And I uh, learned from experience that students procrastinate, as we all do, so that I had to set a deadline of about a week before the final for the last email submission. Or otherwise, there was one time I didn't, and I was buried in email three days before the exam. There was one day I couldn't work on the exam because I was answering email. And I'm talking six or eight hours of answering email. But with all of that, I got an incredible amount of work out of those kids even though they didn't want to do it. <laughs> and uh, so this online tutorial idea, um, what's, what's really gratifying is after they graduate or during the bar review or whatever, they come back and they'll see me and they say, boy, I really appreciate what you did. Um, and it's also the online old exams tutorial idea. Uh, it's really good for those, those kids who don't want to talk in class. You'll hear from people that would never say a word to you in front of other people. But it gives them an opportunity for this interaction. And I'm running it out. i got about one minute left. I will finally uh, make a pitch. If you don't like to type, Dragon Naturally Speaking is uh, a wonderful adjunct. I dictate all my exams to my computer. and. Uh, Although you got to be careful, it assumes that everybody's from New Jersey, so it, didn't <laughs> it did not understand me for a long time. I had to, I had to train it to understand my my accent. But uh, uh, I want to encourage you to, to, to think about the possibilities of technology because I'm convinced that uh, it is greatly enhanced what I do. Thanks. I'm Fred Williams. Uh, I teach criminal law, criminal procedure, legal letters, pleading and practice, and interviewing, negotiation, and counseling. So I do practical uh, law teaching. And I always like the practical effect of having to follow Jim Beckman. 
because he always takes a lot of time, which cuts into my time, so I don't have to talk as long. <laughs> and he thinks he only used 10 minutes. <laughs> How long did he go? 18? <laughs> but I love it. He's very interesting, and he's the only person I know that gets excited about contracts and commercial law. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to talk about two things, uh, and I can tell you I am not technologically intelligent or very good at using technology if I have to mash the buttons and push the things. Uh, what I do is I, I say they hire these uh, people who are tech support, and what I want technology to do is to make my job easier and to also help me to respond to students' complaints because we all know that especially in practical skills courses, the students will always accuse you of being subjective rather than being objective in your grading. And so I have found that using technology, especially uh, the overhead projector, this screen, and when students are doing their performances, uh, that a video camera such as that one that has a feed into that projector that will show what they're doing on that board that has a video recorder attached to it is going to be of great benefit to me, especially when I am reviewing their performance with them and when I am explaining to them why they got the grade that they got. And here's how it works. I go to grade Clinton and I say, great, I've got uh, students who are going to be doing their interviews or their counseling sessions or their negotiation sessions and I really don't want the rest of the class to have the time off when one person is doing their performance because that way we won't, won't end up with the requisite hours we need for class. So when these people are doing their performances, I want the class to be in session and I want them to be able to observe the performance so that they can make comments, critique along with me, so that they can learn from what their colleagues are doing, what is good or what is bad. And I'll say, how can you help me? And what he'll do is figure out a way to do it. What we did most recently is we have a room that is for interviews that didn't have a camera in it. However, it had been wired so that we could put a camera in that room that had a feed into the projector in the classroom where the class met that would put the interview on the screen while all of the other students were present. And it would also be videotaping that performance. And here's what it permitted me to do. It permitted me to make all of the students come to the performance. Though they were not in the room where the performance was being conducted, therefore they would not interfere with the interviewee or the interviewer. They would be taking notes because I use a, as best I can, objective format as to what I'm looking for. And I would give that to the students in the class and say, grade your colleague on their performance using this format. And for, as a, an example, with the client interview, I use, uh, any of you know about the client counseling competition that the ABA LSD uh, sponsors? Well, we use their format to judge the student performance, and I would give each student one of those and say, okay, here are the 11 or 12 things I want you to look at with respect to this interview, and you tell me what you think about your colleague's performance. In the past, I would have to do that as they were doing that performance because I didn't have anything else to do in order to give them whatever grade they were going to get. Now I've got a videotape that I can take home and later spend all the time I want to to review it. But I also, when I review that, I have the student's comments. And after the interview, that student who has performed comes in the classroom, and, they, and rather than just me telling them how I think they perform, their classmates will tell them. The classmates will tell them things that they thought they did wrong, things that they thought they did right, and so all of the venom is not directed at me. <laughs> it's directed at their classmates. But that kind of helps me because it gives them an idea that I'm not by myself uh, subjectively evaluating them. And they also have the opportunity then 
if somebody did a really good job, to ask them, how did you accomplish that? What did you do? How did you go about doing it? It helps me an awful lot. Uh, the other thing that it does is when they come to get their grade, if they're dissatisfied, what I also have available is the performance of every student. And generally what will happen in a class of, say, size of 20, there will be five different problems of interviewing. Maybe somebody will interview on a domestic violence problem. Somebody will do a real estate problem. Somebody will do a criminal uh, law, a criminal procedure problem. But there will be different areas, and there will be four students who will do each one of those type interviews. So they'll have somebody to compare their performance with. The uh, client fact pattern is the same. And so what you're looking to see is whether they get all the information and how comfortable they make the client, whether they address the issues <coughs> that have been raised. And it's four people who do that, so it's not me just judging one person and saying you did a good, good or bad job. I can compare them to their colleagues. The um, other advantage to that is that, you know, we all think we don't have flaws. Well, in the video, as Jim would say, in your face. You don't say, I tell you, you say yes after every answer from the client, or you say mm every time you begin a sentence, or you have some little other idiosyncrasy, and you argue with me that you don't, and then there is the tape. And you'd be surprised at how that videotape cuts down on a lot of the complaints that uh, are received from students. So what I have is uh, a good person who knows how to use this technology. I generally don't know what it is I want. I go and tell him what I want to accomplish because I want to make my life simpler. If I can, I want to work uh, as little as the next person. And if, there, <laughs> if, there, if there is some way that he can assist me, he will, and I've been quite uh, pleased with uh, every opportunity I've had a need that when I've taken it to Greg, he's been able to assist me in some way or another. The other thing I want to talk just a minute about was using the screen, the computers that we have in the classroom to uh, review exams with uh, students. One of the classes I teach is criminal law, and at our school we require that all first-year students have a midterm exam in their first-year courses. And since they only take criminal law in the second semester of their first year, uh, criminal law is a little bit different from that civil stuff. And uh, it requires a little bit different thinking, of course, you know, the burdens of proof changes and that kind of stuff. So. You get students who have already been through civil procedure, torts, property, that kind of stuff in the first semester, and then they're taking it again in the second semester, and all of a sudden you throw criminal law at them, and they go, what the heck? A lot of them do because they tell you they don't come to law school to practice criminal law. They come to learn about that law where they can make a lot of money. So, you know, I have people saying, well, I just don't understand at the midterm you know, I did well on all of my midterms in those civil courses, and I'm, not, I'm just not getting this criminal law stuff. Uh, I, I need some help. And what they want you to do is take their exams individually, and they come into your office and have you review the multiple choice questions with them one at a time. And I've never had less than 60 students in my criminal law class, and I don't have an hour and a half, two hours to for every student to go over the multiple choice exam. So what I do is I take the disk I have, I insert it into the computer, it comes up on the smart board, and it comes up on this screen. And I will tell the students that this is the day we're going to review the multiple choice on the midterms. You can come and we will review it. And what they're expecting me to do is to come in, put it up on the board, and tell them, read the question, okay, this is the right answer. And what I do is just the opposite. I ask the, the students, all right, who picked A? And some will raise their hands. Who picked B? Who picked C? Who picked D? 
And then I have those one pick one from each to explain why they pick A, B, C, and D, and explain to them why. Not me explaining it to them, but let the person who picked the right answer explain to them. Because you know, once somebody picks A and the answer is C, everybody in the class goes, no, no, well, that's not it, that's not it. So you pick the person who shows the greatest enthusiasm to explain why C is the answer. And then the students turn away from getting on me about why that's the right or wrong answer and get on that student. <laughs> <laughs> and that student gets the opportunity to explain. And they generally do a good job of why they chose C as the right answer. And of course, when I say, yup, that's the right answer, and also explain why, their chest is puffed out. And then other students say, well, hey, will you tutor me? Man, I don't have to do it. <laughs> so that's how I use our technology, and it has been very helpful. And if it has done nothing else, it has helped certainly cut down on the amount of time I have to spend with each individual student who is complaining about their grade or an answer on an exam. Thank you. Right, and I uh, teach contracts, and I also teach the uh, legal reasoning and writing um, course. And um, like Fred, I'm I, I'm not a techie. Uh, as a matter of fact, people who know me well would be shocked that I'm even presenting <laughs> on technology uh, today. But um, I would echo the sentiments of uh, my colleagues who came before me when I would say that. Um, that Greg and our technology staff were instrumental in um, my decision to um, transition to the use of technology uh, as quickly um, as I did. I certainly felt that uh, the use of the technology would facilitate my work, uh, that it would be beneficial to the students, um, but it was instrumental um, to have someone uh, who was there to support uh, that effort and to um, just make the transition uh, easy. And the technology that we have, uh, I would consider it to be user-friendly technology, which was also uh, very helpful in um, my uh, transition. In terms of the resources uh, that I use, of course, uh, we were given the option, uh, I guess, uh, maybe about two or three years ago, um, to uh, select either uh, a laptop or a desktop uh, computer, and I, I chose the laptop. And uh, I found, of course, that to be um, extremely uh, helpful in terms of um, just helping with my working on assignments, exams, et cetera, and just working back and forth between home and the office. And so the, uh, the laptop was, I guess, my introduction into uh, the technology that, that we have now. I also started using Twin uh, a couple of years ago. And um, I use it uh, primarily to post uh, old exams, to post practice problems. Um, I also, more recently, have begun using it to post other types of assignments. I post my syllabi uh, on uh, Twin. And uh, I found that to be extremely useful because before we would uh, place um, exams on reserve uh, in the library and invariably those exams would disappear over the course of the year. So it was a matter of having to go back and, and uh, just um, reconstruct uh, the file uh, from year to year. And with putting the materials on twin, uh, it has been uh, excellent. Uh, the students love it uh, because it's certainly convenient for them. They don't have to stand in line and, and copy, etc. Um, and they can just um, uh, download at their convenience. And so they have found that to be extremely helpful. Uh, like uh, Jim, I also use the smart board uh, quite a bit in class. Um, because I, I uh, also teach contracts, and students tend to view contracts as a rather abstract course uh, in comparison with the other uh, courses that they're taking, uh, I tend to be, um, I tend to, to write a lot to try and, and uh, help them to visualize uh, the concepts. 
And um, so for me, the SMART board has been great because, uh, as Jim was saying, uh, in terms of putting the information up there, you get to put a lot of information and because you have all of these different boards that you can use, uh, you can always go back. And before, when I was using just a regular blackboard, uh, I always ran out of space. I always had to make some decisions about what do I leave up, um, what do I take down, because I knew I would want to go back to certain concepts, but I didn't have enough room to leave everything on the board. And so with the smart board, it's just a matter of putting up whatever you, you want to put up, and then you just go back to it uh, uh, when you need to go back to that particular point. Uh, for the first time uh, this year, I incorporated PowerPoint uh, into my presentation. And I used uh, PowerPoint actually for my end of year review. Uh, at the end of each semester, I um, have an, an additional session where I actually go uh, back over the course materials and review with the students. And uh, because it is a review and it does encompass quite a bit of material, um, it was always, again, a lot of writing, uh, trying to, uh, trying to uh, determine how to uh, condense the information in such a way that I could get it all uh, out there to them and um, have them to be able to uh, just get the big picture, finally, as opposed to the little concepts that we had talked about uh, during the course of the semester. And PowerPoint, again, um, was um, very good in enabling me to uh, help to get them to visualize uh, the concepts in a much broader uh, manner. And um, for the first time this year, uh, I also was um, one of the um, professors who volunteered to participate in um, the pilot um, project using ExamSoft. And um, over time, of course, I don't know, for me, because I do so much of my work on the computer these, these days, I feel that it has actually affected my uh, penmanship because I feel like my handwriting has just deteriorated over the years. And, uh, and I feel that my students have experienced the same thing um, because it seems to get more and more difficult to read uh, exams. And um, so I was happy to participate in that, that project. And I had about, because our students weren't required to have laptops um, for this past academic year, it had to be a voluntary um, process. So those students who wanted to could elect to take their um, final exam using the exam soft. And I had maybe about maybe 10 to 15 students who elected uh, to do that uh, out of a class of approximately 60. Um, for those students who, who did, um, it was just, and, and I guess it was good because I was able to compare, um, uh, just going through the blue books and, and reading the exams and actually reading uh, the exams from uh, the exam saw. And um, it was, first of all, just so much easier on the eyes uh, to read the, uh, the typed answers versus the answers, the handwritten answers in the, uh, the blue books. And uh, one thing that I was concerned about, because we had raised this whenever the representative um, from uh, the company had come to talk to us about the exam saw, and that was whether or not when you see an answer, and the answer, just because it's typed and it looks better, uh, is it going to give that student an edge over someone else? And um, in reflecting back, I felt that uh, that did not happen at all because uh, I was able to, as I was reading uh, the exam answers, I found that there were some exam answers, uh, typed exams that is, some of the exam answers were uh, very well written. Uh, there were other answers that uh, were not, and uh, they were not affected by the fact that the student had typed the answer. Uh, another concern that I had was whether or not a student uh, who had uh, typed the exam, of course, they couldn't use uh, any kind of um, they couldn't go back and, and do any corrections uh, on the, uh, use the correction software on the exam. But what I was trying to determine was whether um, uh, errors that I saw, whether they were typos or whether they were, for example, a spelling error, uh, and whether that student, again, was getting some type of, of advantage because it was a typed answer. And again, I felt that I was able to, to make that distinction as I read through the, the, the answers. And um, the uh, one, um, I guess, thing that I picked up on in reading the answers, and that is that um, students, some of the students, obviously, who opted to type their exams were students who um, 
uh, were not very good typists. Uh, so, and it showed in their answers, uh, because you're typing, you're typing under pressure, and you're having to hunt and pet, and uh, that doesn't make for a good combination. Um, so, I would think that that's something that I would continue to see as we hopefully uh, move more uh, along the lines of expanding on uh, the use of the uh, exam saw. Um, and that is probably the need for students who are to actually uh, take a keyboarding class so that they are more proficient uh, at that. Um, but I have been um, extremely pleased with the, the technology that, that we have. And again, with the use of exam saw, for example, um, uh, Greg and the technical staff took care of all of the, the details. So for me, it wasn't really, I, I didn't, couldn't really tell a difference in terms of the administration of the exam. Uh, because I, I didn't have to do uh, anything that was uh, very different from what I had done um, before. And so again, for me, uh, the, our technology, um, the, the technical staff that we have, uh, I would say has been just very instrumental in the ease with which I have made my transition into uh, incorporating the use of technology in my class preparation as well as, as my uh, teaching. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Yes. I'm so impressed with this participation rate. Um, I, I haven't heard anybody at these conferences talk about this kind of thing. And I'm really glad to have faculty here. Um, at my school, I'm at the University of Georgia, and I, I, I think I hear a number of other people talk about this. We have a kind of core of about five faculty who really like the technology, who really use it a lot. And I also really appreciate the range of, of uh, the kind of motivation that y'all are talking about in terms of where you're coming from as faculty. Can anybody point to something in terms of the, the dynamic and culture at the school from a faculty point of view that kind of moved you perhaps from having something like where there's a kind of core of the techie folks and, and people, it started to branch out further than that? I think if, if one, advantage is being a state school in the context of a state budget crunch. That technology, for me, it, one factor is the cost advantages. It's a relatively, for me, uh, I think we get greater productivity, don't you think? We get, get more, I think we get more work done from the faculty standpoint. Uh, it's been, I think what happened was you notice that from the most of the faculty we have, a lot of them didn't have experience in using technology uh, initially, uh, but they just jumped into it. Um, it seems as though um, um, there was there were we had to make it easy for them to use it, as well as make it a part of. They had to take ownership on it, as well as uh, because we were kind of tight for money in some ways. Uh, we we're trying to we tried to. Uh, find ways to, to um, do things more efficiently, and we do a lot of testing. And we, we involve faculty in testing, like we just tested uh, at Samsung this past semester. Uh, and we, we asked faculty they will, will test it. So it becomes more on their end to try to, uh, um, to use the technology as well as to, uh, for us to find out. What, we're not driving the purchases, the, uh, the faculty. I, I think I, I'll just answer uh, one of the things I think many of us have said is Greg does make himself uh, very available and he does encourage us to ask him what he can do to help us. Uh, that, that motivated me because, you know, if I had to do what he did to help me, I probably would have said, hey, with it, you know, I'll just do it the old fashioned way. But we do have a very uh, accessible tech support, and part of it is probably because we are a state institution and they cut budgets and he wants to keep his job. <laughs> That's really what it is. <laughs> one, one quick point, too, is if some faculty are using technology advantageously, the students will complain to the technophobic faculty who are doing it. I, I, I said, well, I didn't have a file on one exam, so I was going to put paper on reserve. And you said, the rolling of the eyes. <laughs> so, 
questions in the back. Question in the back. Do you have a formalized uh, plan for the faculty, or is it just one-on-one, case-by-case? This is more one-on-one, -on -one, case by case. It's there are three goals I had about the faculty. One, I want to make sure all the faculty were using twin. Uh, like Fred, I like to save work. Westlaw is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for tech support. So faculty can call them all the time to use twin. So that keeps us from having to do webs, a lot of web stuff on our own. The second thing that I want to make sure before I came to the law school, I used to consult to law firms and churches. I had this one client who was a partner in a, in a pretty large law firm who used his computer as a calculator because, you know, that's, he didn't want to take the time because he made whatever he made an hour, it just didn't make sense. As well as you have the peer, you have the peer pressure of if you're the big cheese or the, or the, or the partner, you can't be caught not knowing. So it, it was, in, my, in that case, we Talk, I work directly with the partner and quite in silence or in, by himself or without the other tech people around or without the other partners around. With the faculty, uh, I use the same strategy. Uh, I use go to them individually and then I try to get a cluster of the faculty together who are on the same page to work with each other. How many full time faculty do you or how many full time staff do you have in you? Uh, I have me, um, a CNE, and about eight students. And then we use consultants from the university. Yes. The recurring thing in terms of the particular piece of technology that all of you seem to be using is that smart board. Um, I, I have a logistical question and also a, a sort of productivity question. So it's, it's, are you using a smart board that is hooked up through a wire, or are you using a wireless smart board um, that hooks up into your AMX system or something else? And are the students, do you think the students are pressing other professors to use smart board technology more after they've seen you sort of demonstrate it? Or? I can answer the first one. <laughs> okay. I can answer the second is wired. I'm not certain. My colleagues haven't complained and said, I wish you wouldn't do that because I'm being getting complaints. I, I just, I'm not certain. You know? I, I don't know. No, I, I haven't gotten any feedback uh, from that standpoint. I do think, though, um, that uh, there are more people who, when they see someone else using it and using it successfully, are more inclined to then kind of jump in and begin to, to use the technology. I think it's more from that standpoint. Yes. So, are you using wireless technology to hook them up? Or are you oh, using we're using wireless technology to hook them up. Okay, so you have stationary smartphones. Yes. As we only have two, we only have, we've done two classrooms. And, and those are two classrooms that we have majority of our classes in. Yes, in the back. So your smart board is on the side and it's hooked to the second one? Actually, it's, it's connected to the, well, the way it's, it's, it's connected to the projector, yeah. So we can view it. Why not use the smart board screen? Because the smart board screen is about 60 by 40 or 40 by 60. So it's not large enough for a class of 120 or 100. Or 80 students, whereas this bigger screen is, is, is better. And when we're designing the room, we, we design, design it in such a way where we have wireless mics in the classroom so the professor actually can have the wireless mic on and work on the smart board and still be heard. Any more questions? Okay, I think we're done. <laughs>